Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I start with my disclosure. Yes, I am a surgeon, and I will talk against surgery. So this is my first disclosure. And the question is, what should we do with our next patient who develops, by chance, by accident, a complete clinical response following chemoradiation therapy? So what should we do with these patients who, by accident, achieve a complete clinical response? Well, why do I, why do I say accidentally achieve a complete clinical response? Well, the reason is these patients would have to undergo chemoradiation therapy anyways. Why? Because they have locally advanced disease and they undergo chemoradiation therapy and by chance, by accident, they achieve a complete clinical response, meaning that they achieve all three criteria of what a complete clinical response is. Clinical assessment by digital rectal examination, endoscopic assessment with the whitening of the mucosa. You can clearly see the scar. There's no ulceration, there's no mass, and there's no stenosis of the rectum. And finally, radiological assessment showing no residual disease within the mesorectal envelope, but also a significant response in the primary tumor seen here by a very low signal intensity in, in high resolution MR, or by the use of PET-CT, which in our own hands, the best predictor of a complete clinical response is the decrease in the TLG, which is a combination of SUV and metabolic tumor volume. Whenever you have a 90% reduction of TLG, this was the best predictor of a complete clinical response. Well, for those of you interested in providing these patients organ preservation strategies, I have two important messages for you. Number one, there is no perfect study. MRI, PET-CT, clinical assessment, endoscopic assessment, they all need to be combined for you to improve the accuracy in the identification of these patients. Message number two is it takes time for these patients to achieve a complete clinical response. Again, in our own hands, more than 70% of these patients only achieved a true complete response with all three criteria more than 16 weeks after completion of radiation therapy. So it does take time after, a complete, after chemoradiation completion. What is the standard then? Well, the standard here is total mesorectal excision, TME. Well, I will tell you, this is a terrible operation. Why? Because it's difficult. We surgeons, we still don't know how to perform this operation perfectly. We don't know if we should use the robot, if we should use the laparoscope, if we should do open surgery, if we should do transanal surgery. We don't really know. Why? Because it's difficult. And then at the end of the day, even if you, when you do perfect TME, there's lots of complications. These patients have significant post-operative morbidity. There are uh, urogenital uh, dysfunctions. There's fecal incontinence. There is even mortality after this major operation. And finally, there's a risk of a definitive stoma. Well, what is the risk of a, of a definitive stoma and how relevant is this? We often forget to ask our patients what their expectations for rectal cancer treatment are. This is an interesting study from the United States, and they actually asked patients what their expectations were. Number one expectation, avoiding a stoma. It was not cure, it was not complication. Number one expectation was the avoidance of a definitive stoma. Well, what is the risk of a definitive stoma? The de risk of a definitive stoma may be low at baseline. But over time, it actually triples. Why does it triple? It triples because our anastomoses fail. They fail because of local recurrence. They fail because they leak. They fail because they develop stenosis. And they fail because they have very poor function. So at the end of the day, one out of four patients will end with a definitive stoma. So regardless if these patients are actually cured from their disease, rectal cancer surgery will have a significant impact on the lives of these patients. This is why whenever we see a patient who by chance, by luck, by accident, develop a complete clinical response, these patients are enrolled in a strict follow-up program. It doesn't mean they're never gonna get an operation. It means they'll, never, they'll not get an operation right now, but they eventually will. Why? because there is still a risk of a local regrowth or a local recurrence, if you will. The risk of local regrowth 
is in three years about 22 to 25 percent and these are the two most robust series looking at the regrowth rates among these patients. Well, I will try to show you that the local regrowth is not that big of a deal. Number one is we know about risk factors. Now baseline T stage is one of the most relevant risk factors. Patients who have early stage baseline T status are less likely to develop a local recurrence. As a matter of fact, for each increase in T stage, there's a 10% increase in the risk of local recurrence. So you can see T2, T3, T4, 10% increase in the risk of local recurrence. Nodal disease at baseline is not a uh, risk factor for local recurrence. Patients who had suspected lymph node metastasis at baseline were not more likely to have a local recurrence, provided they achieved a complete clinical response, meaning all three criteria, and were managed non-operatively. Now, the most powerful risk factor is perhaps provided by conditional survival analysis. This is the local recurrence-free survival of patients managed non-operatively. However, when patients achieve one year of follow-up without a local recurrence, the local recurrence free survival actually improves and it actually keeps improving for each additional year the patient is disease free. So that perhaps achieving and sustaining a complete clinic response is the most powerful risk factor for developing a local recurrence. What else? Well, most of the local recurrences have a endoluminal component. 90% of the local recurrences had some type of endoluminal component, meaning that a simple digital rectal examination or a proctoscopy would, be, would have been able to detect 90% of these local recurrences. As a matter of fact, the endoluminal component is the sole component of the recurrence in, in the majority of these patients. Even in the case when you have a exclusive mesorectal recurrence, as you can see here, provided there's good radiological surveillance, you will be able to catch these recurrences and provide proper salvage to these patients. However, remember, this, these cases represent less than 10% of the cases with a local recurrence after management with non-operative management. Another good news is most of the recurrences are amenable to salvage therapy almost 100%. Why not 100%? Because some of these patients do develop systemic recurrence as well, and sometimes providing these patients with salvage surgery and a definitive colostomy will not make sense in the setting of a metastatic disease. But the vast majority are amenable to a salvage procedure. And finally, when you have to go back and do radical surgery for these patients, you actually end up doing the same operation you were intended to do in the beginning. So if the patient is a candidate for an abdominal perineal excision at baseline, when he or she develops a local recurrence, you still have to do abdominal perineal resection. By doing non-operative management or watch and wait, we don't think we're burning, burning any bridges. As a matter of fact, if you detect these patients with the local recurrences early on, you will be able to salvage some of these patients with a local excision and therefore providing another chance for organ preservation among these patients. But this is the best news in terms of local regrowth. Because when you have to salvage these patients, there appears to be no oncological compromise. When you have to go back and salvage patients who were suspected for a complete clinical response, they do no worse than patients that were managed right off the bat from chemoradiation therapy with radical surgery. What about systemic recurrences? There's always a fear that these patients will develop metastatic disease. Well, when you look at the meta-analysis and the systematic reviews, the incidence of metastatic disease is identical between complete clinical responders managed non-operatively and patients managed by radical surgery with a complete pathological response. And these metastatic diseases are in the range of 8 to 12 percent. But you've got to be careful here because the 8 to 12 percent range refers to all patients managed by watch and wait. Those who do have a local regrowth and those who never have a local regrowth. However, it sounds obvious that the majority of patients who develop distant metastasis are those who do develop a local regrowth because they're probably false complete responders. They were mistaken for a complete clinical response.
Everybody was nervous when the Memorial Sloan Kettering put out this paper showing that the patients who actually developed the local regrowth had a much higher risk of a, of a systemic relapse. It actually doesn't look that bad because if you think about it, patients who never have a local recurrence are probably true complete responders. The ones who do have a local recurrence are probably a false complete response. They were mistaken for a complete clinical response, but they were actually not. So no surprise that true complete responders do better than false complete responders. In my opinion, patients who have a false complete response, those who are mistaken for a complete clinical response, they should be compared to patients who had incomplete response but were managed right after chemoradiation completion. And again, when you do this comparison, there are no, no oncological differences between these two subgroups of patients. Now, the last word on survival among these patients is overall survival. This is data from the systematic review and three-year overall survival data showing a 93% overall survival where patients never got adjuvant chemotherapy. Now, this compares favorably to patients managed by radical surgery where the same three-year overall survival was 90%, slightly inferior, but 40% of these patients actually got adjuvant chemotherapy. So not so bad for the patients managed non-operatively here. So perhaps we should move away now from high risk features and accidental watch and wait because this is probably already settled. The real question that we have now is, should we be considering patients for intentional organ preservation? Patients who otherwise would not require chemoradiation therapy for oncological reasons and may undergo chemoradiation therapy for the sole purpose of achieving a complete clinical response and ultimately avoiding major surgery. Well, there's a paradox here because if we want to provide chemoradiation for the sole purpose of achieving a complete clinical response, maybe we want to maximize the chances of achieving a complete clinical response. And this is, again, we're talking about early rectal cancer. Well, if we want to maximize the chances of achieving a complete clinical response, there are two ways of doing so. First is increasing the dose of radiation therapy, and second is by providing more chemotherapy with the use perhaps of consolidation chemotherapy when there is some data to suggest that the more chemo you give, the more uh, complete response rate you have. So at the end of the day, we might be considering patients with early stage disease with more intensive chemoradiation therapy regimens when the sole purpose of providing chemoradiation therapy is to achieve a complete clinical response. As a matter of fact, when we did this same comparison among early rectal cancer patients managed by standard chemoradiation therapy or more intensive chemoradiation therapy with radiation dose escalation and consolidation chemotherapy, the chances of achieving a complete clinical response and successful organ preservation was nearly two times greater. So these patients who underwent more intensive chemoradiation therapy, despite the fact that they were early rectal cancers and for oncological reasons might not have required chemoradiation in the beginning, did so and achieved a complete clinical response in, in, in double the chances when compared to the standard regimen. Uh, I'd like to give credit to the person behind all this vision of chemoradiation therapy as a way of of providing organ preservation strategy. This is Angelita Abergama, who really envisioned this approach. And she taught me that a good surgeon knows how to operate, a better surgeon knows when to operate, but perhaps the best surgeon knows when not to operate. Thank you very much.